<laughs> I think I knocked him down, or he broke. I'm sorry, Mr. Red Plate. Well, that's too bad. We'll just shoot something else. Like this watermelon right here. <laughs> oh, and a two liter right here. <laughs> oh, I wonder if it'll knock this bowling pin off. I believe it will, since it's a 30 odd six. Yes, Hickok 45 here, finally bringing you the O3 Springfield that I've been uh, caressing for a few weeks and enjoying. I mean, just look at that. Is that a beauty or what? Uh, fresh out of the year 1918. That's uh, that's a jewel. That's a jewel. Springfield Armory. Uh, just over a million in serial number. And exactly what I was looking for and have been looking for for years. I just uh, really like this. Let's talk about it a little bit and let's shoot it some more. I really did knock down the red plate, didn't I? Okay, I'll, I'll teach that red plate to, to cause me to miss because I missed him on the first shot. But you know what, we've got a watermelon over there we might uh, we might shoot too. I do struggle with the sight on it. I, I wanted this uh, this Springfield Armory. I wanted one made by Springfield Armory and I wanted uh, an early one. And with that, you get these uh, sights that are, <laughs> oh man, even with the very, very best eyesight, there's just a little microscopic V there and everything. But, and I even painted the front side to try to help me out a little bit. But I didn't get this to go deer hunting or elk hunting at 500 yards and that sort of thing. I got this for the historical uh, significance and just just all of that. That well, I mean, it just oozes history, doesn't it? It's a it's a beautiful gun, and it it, it works. You know, nothing like a good old bolt gun is there. Pretty gun, as you can see. I like the coloring of it, and uh, it was rebarreled in 42, 42, yeah, and. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty much correct, I think. Other than that, there may have been some stock work, but you can see the 42 there, uh, Springfield Armory barrel, and uh, a lot of them were refurbished then, rebarreled, because this thing by 1942 had been around a while, you know, since uh, 1918. So, but it's a it's a jewel, and it's a 30 odd six, a really cool round. So, let's uh, let's load it again before we get too gabby, and we'll uh, take a few more shots. How's that? Okay, because this shoots a really powerful round, and I know you want to hear it, and I want to feel it on my shoulder. See if I can hit anything. I'll even use the cl uh, clips. Or is that a magazine? Let's see, that's right. That's a magazine, and this is the clip. Is that right? Not really, is it? Okay. Load it via the clip, five round clip, and uh, shoot something here, like maybe a two liter. Boom. Told you I couldn't see those sights. Let's try that bowling pin. <laughs> Saw that, didn't I? We'll try that red two liter. Oh, I'm gonna have to move up on him or something. Okay, let me get the sight in the V, in the notch. Where's the notch? There's the notch, I think. Oh no, I hit one of my pigs back there <laughs> with a 30 out six. That's not good. That is not good. Okay, we're empty. Uh, like I say, I have a hard time getting the sight in that little bitty notch and it not being a little kind of moving around on me. But uh, that's okay. I didn't get this this gun to pick off flies or fleas for that matter. <laughs> but we'll we'll get those guys one way or the other. Uh, so the O3 Springfield. This uh, this rifle was in service for a long time. You know, uh, this rifle is really the results of some other rifles that came before it, of course, what we learned uh, that we wanted uh, to make the general rifle, the, the issue rifle, the infantry rifle. This, this rifle uh, was used in just about every branch, as I understand. That was one of the reasons that we wanted a rifle like this, so we could get away from the long musket-type rifles and then having a carbine version of it. and. Uh, just as they did with the Mauser and, and some, I think even the, the Swiss did that, you know, when they came out with the 1911 carbine, they, they eventually went to one rifle, you know, one rifle with smokeless powder and the, the modern innovations of bullets and powder and loads, one rifle in about a 24 inch barrel pretty much takes care of the needs of just about anybody in the military, any branch, you know. So the deal was, you know, we went from the, uh, the a, uh, trap door, Springfield, you know, in 4570 to the crag in the 1890s. 
and this was pretty cool having a bolt gun and having a magazine that would hold like five rounds with pointed bullets you know that kind of thing you could uh, step it up a little bit and uh, the only problem was let me grab one here was the loading method which I like it's pretty cool of course it doesn't really matter if you're just out doing woods walks and you're hunting or you're just shooting on the range does it put them in there and close them up pretty cool uh, but in combat uh, we discovered during the Spanish American War you know in the late 1890s that the clip fed guns seem to be easier and quicker more efficient to reload and even as cool as this is it, it just uh, you could fumble around and they, they developed a clip for it but it, it didn't work as well as the Mauser clip so um, it you know, just wanted to change and then also we wanted a hotter round than even the Krag. And the Krag was considered a pretty nice little round in its day, the 3040 Krag, but it was not anything as you know close to the 8 millimeter with the uh, you know the the Mauser or the 30 out six, of course, which wasn't around yet. But uh, we experimented, the military experiment with some hotter rounds that were closer to those ballistically, but the one lug bolt just wouldn't. Uh, withstand it the, the pressure they experimented for I think a year or two and they discovered that you know this bolt has one lug you see the lug there that's uh, let me point use this little bullet as a pointer for those of you who maybe only know what a lug is period some of you new shooters but that lug there that piece of metal uh, on the side of the bolt is what when you push it forward you see that groove up there you turn it it turns down into that and that's what holds it in place see makes sense that, that locks it into place well that, that worked pretty well but when you step up the ballistics, uh, they discovered that wasn't enough, and it was failing, apparently. Uh, whereas the Mauser has a lug on both sides of the front of the bolt, okay, and then one in the rear. So you had a better lock-in. Well, this has a little lug, too, back there. See, it locks right there as well, kind of a small butt. When you look at your uh, receiver here, this is a split, and, uh, you know, so it's pushing against the side. You wouldn't have quite as much support with that either if it came right down to it. So you've got basically on the front of the bolt one lug. And that limited how much you could step up this round, the 3040 Krag, ballistically. Nice gun, but limited in that sense. Okay, I really like it myself. Okay, and then, uh, like I say, these are the two guns that led us to the Ott uh, 3 Springfield. With the Mauser, you notice in the bolt, you've got a lug on both sides of the front. So, you know, you've got your extractor there, and one's inside that. But you've got a lug there and a lug there. And when you push it forward, and lock it down. Both of those lock into uh, little, little recesses that are mortised out in the receiver. And then uh, back here, there's one as well. See that lug right there? And you push forward, and there's a little recessed area that goes down into. So you're locked up back here, and in two places, it's forward. It's a very strong lockup. You got your non rotating extractor. You know, it stays in place no matter what position the bolt's in. Your extractor's right there. Okay, it doesn't move. The bolt does within it. Okay, so it may be more knowledge, more information than you wanted, but uh, that's bolt action 101. <laughs> Very popular design, isn't it? So we 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 incorporated those things into the Aunt three uh, so that we could increase the power of the cartridge and just have a better RAM. Okay, so there's no secret you know we copied the Mauser pretty much in a lot of ways and even uh, supposedly paid them some some money for doing so all right so that's how that works and of course the clip feeding we like that's faster you noticed uh, as I was loading the the all three Springfield loaded pretty well so that that does work well and uh, in a battle situation you've got some of those you can pull them out and just keep them in there whereas if you don't have the clip and I don't think the clip worked well I've never had one for the uh, Krag but uh, you end up jiggling those things around. If you get one in there a little bit cross or crooked or the, the rear of the cartridge in ahead of the front, you can have problems. So that's not good. People are shooting at you. I wouldn't like that, would you? So, so then we end up with the Springfield. You see, we've got a similar bolt. You notice the lugs on both sides of the, the bolt there in the front. And push forward and locks down the same way. Now back here, you you got the lug in a little bit uh, different place, but you got a nice big lug there that locks against the rear of the receiver there. So in three different places, you got that bolt locked in, so it will withstand who powerful cartridge ballistically, like the 30 out six. So pretty cool, huh? Not bad at all. 
So very much like the Mauser, and, and you know, in size and everything. You know, if you put them side by side, you know, they're it's kind of the American Mauser. They're, uh, they're I I like the Mauser. I like this. I think more, but uh, they both work. So beautiful gun, beautiful gun. Now when it first came out, it was in a it was in a thirty out three, and then later thirty out six. And uh, we'll talk about that. I don't have any thirty out three ammunition. Sorry about that. But I do have some nineteen fifties vintage. 30 out 6. This ammo is pretty old, as old as I am. Let's see if it'll work. Actually, it will, because that's what I was shooting there a minute ago. We also have some from 1942, uh, right here. Can you imagine that? And this has been in the clip since uh, 1950. 53, I think, is the date on the cartridges. So, pretty interesting. Some of you ask how long ammo will last. Generally, it lasts pretty well. Let's take a couple more shots, see if I can get an eyeball on that sight well enough to, uh, to hit something. Okay. You notice I struggle sometimes when I'm loading via the clip on an SKS or something, but it just works better and, and easier with this. See if I can see the sight. All right. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> okay. Ah, flower pot. I'll be darned. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, here's a close flower pot. That's more my speed with that little bitty sight. See if I can hit it. What do you want to bet? <laughs> yeah, I think a 30 out 6 will take care of that pretty well. Ooh, we have one more round. Well, let's go ahead and take it at the watermelon. It'll probably take me about 30 rounds to hit that. Now, I'm going to take a few shots at it. If we uh, struggle too much, I may have to walk over there and stab it or something. Uh, so, like I said, the uh, this is the best of both worlds. It has a nice smooth bolt, kind of maybe not as smooth as a Crag, but we tried to borrow from the Crag and then especially from the Mauser. And uh, in 1900, I think they they came up with the first prototypes of it, and then in 1903 went into production. It was in the 30 out three cartridge, but it was in 1903, and that's that's where it hits the name out three Springfield. And there's some confusion there, you know, people, I don't get that. It's a 30 out 6 and it's the out 3 and when did it come out? I thought it was adopted in 05 or 06. And, and, and so, you know, it, it's a little bit confusing to people that, uh, but anyway, the cartridge was, was improved in, in I think 1905 and 1906 when they, they improved it and went through the out 6. So they named the cartridge the 30 out 6. So what it turned out to be finally when we officially adopted the rifle in I think 05, and then we, we changed the cartridge from the 03, beefed it up, made it more powerful, more like the Mauser round. Uh, it was in, in 06, 1906. So that's where that name comes from, 30 out 6. Some cartridges like the 4570 are based on the caliber 45 and then 70 was 70 grains of powder. You know, so I know it gets crazy when you look back through all the different cartridges and their names, and some of them are based on the length of the cartridge, the second number. Some are based on how much powder they held, and then the 30 out 6 is based on the out 6 means 1906. So this is the gun, I guess you could say, made the 30 out 6 famous or started it on that route, and then, of course, the Grand later, right, and other firearms. But uh, 30 out 6 is uh, what this gun is known as, and so you can forget everything I said about the 30 out 3. A lot of people probably don't even know that. I wasn't even sure of that myself. But uh, 30 out 6 in a uh, great bolt action rifle, a beautiful, beautiful gun. Of course, uh, it was used in World War One, World War Two. We didn't have enough Garands. The Garand came around in 1937, but we didn't have enough of them. And uh, so this was used, as I understand, in the Pacific a lot, you know, especially by the Marines. And and then, of course, as a sniper rifle, we have lots of talk about sniper rifles, don't we, on the internet? But it was used as a scoped, you know, sniper rifle in, uh, well, I guess in World War One too, but in World War Two especially, and then uh, Korea, and uh, even early days of Vietnam. Okay, so and in, in other places around the world. So uh, let's think about it: a bolt action. I mean, you go to a sporting goods store today, and you will find quality bolt action rifles, people buying them all the time. It's a very popular design. It just works. So this gun, uh, how could it ever really become obsolete? 
we're still buying guns just like this, based on the same action, the, the great Mauser action, you know, the all three action. And then a lot of these have been sporterized, you know, for hunting and that kind of thing. There's just not a lot you can do to it to make it better, you know, more uh, stronger. You, just, you really couldn't. Now, you could add a better sight. But like I said, I wanted this version. The A3, that I think it came along more uh, later towards World War II in the 40s, has a, an aperture sight on the rear, which makes it a little bit more like uh, an M1A or a, you know, a, a M1, a Garand, you name it, AR-15. You got your aperture, your ghost ring sight, and boy, I love those. My eye loves those too, because you can just pull those up and you just find a front sight and put it on the target, bang. You know. So if I were really wanting to hunt or just shoot a great deal or go to Camp Perry and uh, see if I could even place, you know, it wouldn't be with this gun, obviously. I'd want that aperture sight. But I wanted an older one, you know. I've got lots of bolt guns, lots of guns with great sights. And I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep if I you know, actually miss a two liter here because I can't really, you know, get my eyeball on that little sight. That's okay. I can sleep with that. I can live with that and still sleep, something like that. So it's just a beautiful piece of hardware. Let's load it up another time here. Now, you know, so we have the, the now the, the bayonet that, uh, that's my Garand bayonet, but it works on this because it was the same bayonet basically, just longer. Uh, it was, I think a 1905 model or whatever. Same bayonet, but just longer, mainly. And uh, it fits on here. So I've got my bayonet for deer hunting. You know, just anything I want to do with this baby, all right? And again, as I said, uh, this, this length barrel replaced all the other variants, really. Uh, so basically, the, the military rifle was a 24-inch uh, barrel. The, uh, he replaced all variants of the Krag, uh, you know, the, the Lee Model 1895, the, the 1885 Remington. You know, the Navy, I think, used those. And so this became the officially adopted rifle for all those uh, forces. And, uh, and I think it was officially adopted like June the 21st, 1905. But like anything, there's, there's some in the field. They're making them. They're experimenting with them and all that kind of thing. And I believe there were around 800,000 of them made before World War I started. And a little note on that along those lines. Uh, one reason I had a little trouble finding one I wanted, I found a few gun shows in different places, but I look, you always want to check the serial number. If you plan to shoot it, you, you really probably want one that is, has a higher serial number than 800,000. They had some metallurgy issues before 800,000. There weren't that many failures. They were pretty rare, as I understand. And a lot of people will tell you, oh, don't worry about it. I've been shooting those things. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, but that's pretty much an established fact. That's not uh, internet myth or anything. Uh, after 800,000, you're okay. So I knew that. And uh, so I was looking for something kind of in this range. This is just over a million. Great, great number for me. I wanted one as old as I could find in good shape that was over 800,000, and I have it, and I love it. It is a wonderful rifle. Uh, I don't know what we have here. Oh, let's take a few more shots at that uh, at watermelon before I have to go over there and kick it, okay? I don't know if I'll ever do anything with the sights. A firearm like this, I just really hate to, to change it. I might break down and, oh boy, I'd hate to paint those rear sights pink or anything. <laughs> I've already put some white paint on the front. It's so bad, isn't it? I like the, that clip feeding. Works so well. You know, you see me. I struggle every time I try that with the SKS. I mean, it, I just I cut my finger, everything else. It's really cool that it works so well on uh, this rifle. Uh, same with the Mauser. It just, it just works. Okay. I'm not sure where I'm uh, holding incorrectly, but well, it's at least scary. Let me find that notch. left in it. Okay. Find the notch. Man, that looks left too. Okay. I think I got a piece of it or the barrel, one or the other. Just can't see it. Try another shot. <laughs> Whoa. I'm not sure if that was a piece off the barrel or, or what. But uh, this, uh, this is a beauty. And again, 
uh, let me go over a couple of things with the gun. The, uh, the uh, bolt here operates much like the Mauser. It's easy to take the bolt out. You just, uh, just a little over down the middle, comes out. How's that? And push it right back in. Now, this was pretty, pretty nice, smooth operation. Now, you notice I had this lever up, and that is a magazine. Well, no, that's in regular operation. So uh, I can just load it, shoot it like I've been doing. Now, if you put this down, you have a magazine cutoff. So you can, you can put a round in and just load one at a time, and it won't take one out of the magazine. Now, again, as I've explained, I think, with uh, Craig, one of the rifles earlier in the video, that you, uh, you might want to, uh, if you're in a situation where you just want to load one at a time and keep five in the magazine, you can do that and then if you need to attack or if you are attacked you have your magazine in reserve you know, if you're behind I guess I, I know nothing about military strategy really but but if you're behind the wall you know, and you're you're just plinking and you're not needing to load and reload in a hurry you can just put one in at a time uh, fearing that you might need those five quickly or something I don't know what the situation might be but that's a that's a nice feature to have right there it's pretty cool pretty cool okay and uh, again We've got our bayonet we wanted to demonstrate, and we have 1950s ammo. That is pretty neat. Let me show you. Yeah, 1952. I don't know if you can see that, but that ammo has been in that clip since 1952, and it's been in the the pouch. These these pouches is what it came in uh, all that time. And a couple of them were a little bit corroded on the ends. But uh, we took it out for the first time. Most of it, I laid one aside here that was a little bit, looked a little bit, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it looks like a little, little crate. I'm not gonna try to shoot that. Maybe it's a dirty chamber, we'll clean it up. But it's pretty cool that that ammo has been around that long and that this has been around since the 40s. We fired some of this and we, about one out of six or seven uh, was a dud. Interesting. But you know, some of these had the date on the, on the head. Yeah, it's hard to see, but I think that's, a, that's one of 40. Three, I think. I, don't know, I can't see it very well. I don't know. But uh, a lot of them had 42 or 43 on them. That may, that may not be one of them. There's some others mixed in here too that have some other strange markings. But most of it was 42. And we were getting some duds. And it was interesting. We didn't see any uh, variation in the power of the round. It seemed to shoot fine when it shot. But some of them, the primer was the primers were dead on them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Did I hit that watermelon at all, John? I don't think I touched him. Did I get him once, maybe? Let's just let him, him lie there. I'm not going to waste any more 30 out 6 ammo on him until I decide what I'm going to do with these sights. But you know what? We've got a watermelon right here. I can't let him uh, escape. He is close enough. I think I can hit him. I, I really do. I don't, I don't think I'll have any problems. I won't be able to use the sights as an excuse. So, why don't we do this? Why don't we cut him? You know what though? Let's put him just just for kicks. Let's let's try a core lock. You know that's one of the advantages in this. I almost forgot. I brought it out here for that reason. You can fire. It's a 30 out six. You may have different point of impact. These are 180 grain uh, bullets. The standard military rounds are 147, 150, basically 150 grain bullet going around 2,800 feet per second, maybe 2,900 feet per second. That's pretty fast for a bullet of that size, you know. So uh, that's just kind of the, the classic. They experimented with some other, I think, uh, bullets from time to time and different uh, ballistical or ballistics, you know, involved in the 30 out six. But they landed. I think they came back to that around 150 grain bullet going about that speed. Now these are 180 grain and these are soft tip. But again, because it's not a tubular magazine or something, you can you can do different things and experiment a little bit. So these are 180 grain. I can tell those are really heavy now. Uh, soft tip. Let's put a couple of those in. This might be a round you would use uh, hunting. I don't know. Core lock. That's a, that's a famous round. Uh, by the way, these were uh, Dan's ammo. I'll put a link up. They sent us all this ammo. About a thousand rounds of various things. Uh, we really appreciated that. We've had it for a good while. We just haven't shot a lot of it. Uh, some of it we have. Let's uh, put a couple of these in and just try them out. I think, I don't know, you know, with that soft tip, it might not pierce that watermelon. What do you think? Uh, should I put two or three or four or five? Yeah, I'll tell you what, let's do. Yeah, let's put about three of them in there. And uh, we might want to hit that bowling pin before we shoot the 
water mouth. But you know what? I'm going to put the safety on. That's the safety up. Okay. I'm going to take those out. John wonders if I've lost my mind. Because I'm going to put the bayonet on, and I just have a problem with putting a bayonet on when the gun's loaded. I know that uh, in the trenches, you wouldn't worry too much about that, but uh, I'm not in the trenches, so I'm going to unload it. Now, let's put those back in there. Is that a pretty uh, rig or not? Safety on. How'd you like to uh, climb into a deer stand with something like that? Isn't that nice? You got a 30 out six, a nice bolt action rifle. You know, a nice bayonet. You are prepared. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't guess I'll shoot my bayonet. Let me put one on that bowling pin there. I can't. Uh oh. That's all right. I'm going to shoot the bowling pin and see if I can hit him. Oh, I did, didn't I? And we got one round left. Let's just take out, well, I'll tell you what, let's stab this guy. I think he deserves it. He's got a face on him. You think? <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to do, don't you? You think I ought to? man the things I do for you people look at that look at that my beautiful Springfield Aught 3 antique cherished firearm filled with watermelon juice oh, I'll tell you oh well thanks to Ballastall a little cleaning rag or two we'll get him cleaned up <laughs> beautifully you notice I didn't do that first we just couldn't resist oh look at that van with watermelon juice all over it oh man the real deal is that cute or what? You know, and that's the neat thing about these. Uh, you know, they're antiques, they're old, historical. You think about the people that carried these and, you know, how it's the reason we're able to own these things. Isn't that ironic? We're able to own these guns and shoot them uh, on our own ranges or on other ranges because people carry these into battle, you know, to keep us free. And you just can't help but think about all that stuff when you got one of these in your hand. You wonder where it's been, who's carried it. You know, the real deal, a real bayonet, this stuff, none of this is replica, you know. If, if it were, that'd be cool too. But this is the real stuff. It was it was used, and the dates are on it. The serial numbers are there. And uh, to be able to bring it out on a range and just uh, show it, shoot, enjoy it, even if I can't see the sights very well. It, uh, you folks that are gun nuts, and you probably are if you're watching this, you're gun shooting enthusiasts, I should say, right? Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I wish more people who haven't gotten into shooting yet, we're still working on them, uh, knew that and could appreciate that. And I think a lot of them will if we keep working on them, right? So anyway, just a beautiful rifle. The uh, Springfield Aught 3 it, it will be prettier when I get it cleaned up, but uh, nice gun. Life is good.